Welcome to the Survive the Hunt podcast live on Clubhouse. Today's episode, Don't Be Texas. Oh my God. This morning, misery in Texas. State officials offering little guidance on when any of it will be over. Every source of power that the state of Texas has, has been compromised. Officials revealing today that on Sunday, demand was so high and conditions so cold, the entire grid was moments away from catastrophic failure. People lining up at a public park in Houston to fill buckets with water from a hose. Concern over food there tonight, empty shelves and freezers. I just, this situation, in our opinion, is just unacceptable. And there's no communication, no feedback, and we're just sitting here trying to stay warm. We are getting no answers, no how, no way. And if it's going to be another week, everybody is going to lose everything they have. Temperatures plummet around the Gulf of Mexico. The weather becomes a matter of life and death for more than just human Texans. Sea turtles going through what's known as a cold stun when the turtles appear lifeless. A massive pileup on I-35 before dawn, up to 100 vehicles involved, at least six dead, 30 injured, people trapped in the wreckage. How do you explain it? I don't think you could explain it in a way that, that anybody can understand. Uh, obviously, we were just not prepared for, for those cold temperatures. Our thoughts and prayers certainly go out to everybody affected by the storms in Texas. And, you know, whenever I see stories like this, it always brings me back to how can how can we help people be prepared for the next disaster? And you heard Governor Abbott there at the end say we just weren't prepared for the cold temperatures. And as much as I like to rag on Texas and Texans especially, you know, this is really no different than any other emergency anywhere in the country. You know, you take the details out of where this happened and what it is, and you're left with people without food, without water, without shelter, power, all the, the staples of life that we're used to. And regardless of, of the event, those get taken away. And, you know, one of the topics that we that we cover here on the Survive the Hunt podcast is prepping and being prepared for this kind of stuff. So today we're going to be discussing how you can be prepared for the next emergency in a very practical sense. We're not going to get too crazy on it. And we're going to give some very specific examples as it relates to Texas and how to learn from what's going on there. Uh, so with that said, let me introduce the co-host of this podcast, Billy Hoffman. Billy, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing great. It's uh, plenty cold here in Michigan, but we are prepared for it. That is good. And an excellent segue. Like I said, we're going to be talking about being prepared for cold weather emergencies, all emergencies, because it basically all boils down to the same thing. So this is a recording live on Clubhouse here in a few minutes. We're going to be taking some questions and input from people in the audience. If you hear something that, that speaks to you or you want to give some input on, please feel free to raise your hand. We'll bring you up and uh, ask questions here in just a bit. But, Billy, what I want to start with is something we've kind of talked about before on, on one of our Practical Prepper episodes, and that is just how to be prepared for an emergency? What are the basics uh, that we're talking about? What are the basics that we're looking for? Because you listen to some of those those news clips and it's it's the power grid that's failing. It's it's the government stuff that, that we all rely on that's failing us. So what can we do as individuals to be prepared for ourselves, for our families, for our neighbors, for our community? Yeah, I think it's important. One of the th main things that we always talk about when it comes to being in a survival situation is uh, focus on what's most important. And I think you're seeing it now, especially in Texas is everyone thinks food or everyone thinks water because those are the big, like sexy things like, Oh, how do I purify water? And how do I kill or trap what I need to eat? But when it really boils down to is shelter is always first concern. And we're really seeing that here. Uh, you know, and obviously they, they still have homes, but, their shelters are failing them because they're not adequate. Yeah, and, and there's compounded situations there when you see water pipes busting and stuff like that. And I saw a uh, I saw a video on a news clip here recently where it was 
like icicles hanging off of somebody's ceiling fan in their basement because their pipes had busted. It kind of thawed out, got wet, and then the cold actually froze it. Um, so it's some really serious stuff there, even still having your shelter. Yeah, I mean, that even does happen up, up here. You know, people, you know, don't winterize their vacation homes correctly or, you know, someone's heater goes out and they don't realize it. Um, I've actually seen um, where, like, water lines broke in someone's garage and the entire garage is an ice cube. Like, literally, like, a solid chunk of ice. Thousands and thousands of pounds of ice just in your garage. So it doesn't take long. It, it really doesn't, especially if, if it's leaking and... A lot of these homes in Texas, if you look at the way they were built, I was talking to one of my friends, his parents, uh, they had, they've had a major catastrophe. Um, you know, the, the homes aren't insulated, so they're not prepared for this, but also because it's so much more affordable, he was telling me that a lot of the plumbing is done from the top down. So a lot of the lines run through the attics. Of course, attics aren't going to have the uh, insulation that the home, the R value that the homes would have. And that's what you're getting. You're getting icicles coming from the top down, and it's really, really sad. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's important, you know, while we're talking tonight to, you know, we think of Texas, and we're using Texas as, as the example of what's going on there. But, you know, going back to what I said, take away the event, take away the location. There's very, very basic things that you have to be prepared for. You have to have an understanding of. So when this happens, whether it's a heat wave in Ohio or an ice storm in Texas, these basic principles that we're going to talk about today are going to keep you covered. Yep. And uh, again, Jake and I didn't really plan this out, but we generally agree on what the basic principles are of, you know, being, uh, you know, shelter, water, food, protection. Um but, you know, I, I think before we jump into that, it's important to understand that when these situations come up is a lot of times it is the unexpected thing. If you polled everyone that lives in the state of Texas and you asked them what what major catastrophe would your state face, very, very few of them would say cold temperatures. Yeah, and, you know... It's it's the same thing anywhere you are. You know, we all tend to forget these natural disasters that happen. You know, Texas had something very similar to this just 10 years ago, which doesn't seem like all that, that long of a time ago. And, you know, you would think that, that we would learn from this stuff, but, you know, we've got such short attention spans. It's, it's very hard to remember something 10 years ago and apply that to life. So it's important to create a pattern, to create a system, just to create a lifestyle of being prepared. That way, no matter what happens to you, you're ready for it. And these, these basic things, you know, water, food, shelter, first aid, uh, I always throw in there, you know, those things are going to keep you going. You see, you see Texas right now or other parts of the country, you know, that five to seven day range is where, is where the trouble happens. So what we're going to talk about today is having a week of preps a week of supplies ready to get you through that first week of disaster and then you can build on there so we're gonna start with the one that billy called sexy and i agree which is water um seven days of water per person billy what's that mean to you and your family so I don't have it necessarily measured out. I, I, I'm sure there is a, and I'm sure you probably actually might know it. I'm sure there is a uh, correct ratio that says this many gallons of water per person, seven days of water. The way that we do it is we have a stockpile of um, bottled water that we just r- rotate, you know, first in, first out, or last in, first out type of thing, grab a case of water when we get a load of groceries, okay, that those cases of water aren't going to last you as long as you, you might think they will. Um, for me, uh, w- when it comes to preparedness is I live on a river, uh, and it's a clean river. So um, I, I have seen a lot of Texans, you know, <laughs> they don't have necessarily have the water sources that we would have up here in the Midwest or especially where I live where I'm surrounded by water. Plus I could, in this situation, I, I could melt snow. So that there's a lot of other options, but for me and my family, um, I would say we generally have 12 to 15 cases of water always on hand. 
and if there was more of an emergency use or need for it, I can run out into the backyard and dip a bucket in the river to flush the toilets or do whatever I need to do with it. Yeah, I think that seven day supply is is key though. And and you're right, there is an actual number and it's a gallon of water per person per day. So, so, yeah, I, didn't even that. I didn't even realize that. So I, I guess I, we have more than that done. Yeah. 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 You're, you're in good shape and it's important too, though, to have actual distilled, clean, purified water that you're going to be drinking and, and living off of because I've seen a lot of people in Texas melting snow and the Giardia and other diseases that will be coming in the next 10 to 15 days for those people is going to be crazy because snow might look clean on top, but there's, you get stuff in that layers and it gets kind of nasty. So you still have to boil it, but I see a lot of people on there just kind of melt it down and, and start, start using it. But man, water is pretty simple. I mean, a gallon of water per person per day, you freeze it, throw it in the garage, whatever. I keep it in my chest freezer cause it keeps my chest freezer frozen in case of a power outage, you know, kind of using a double purpose there, uh, with the survival mentality. But it's simple, man. It's simple and it's cheap. And if you don't have, if you're listening to this and you don't have that seven gallons of water, you know, take take 30 bucks and go to the store and buy water for your family. And, and there's the number one basic necessity you don't have to worry about in this emergency. Yeah, I guess I, I, I forgot about that. My, uh, my, my, it's not chest freezer, it's a stand up freezer, but it's the same idea. I do have probably. 30 to 40 uh, like two liter pop bottles two liter soda bottles uh full of water frozen solid in there um and and honestly that's more so for throw it in the cooler when i'm going somewhere or if the power goes out it keeps the uh it keeps the freezer cold so i don't lose all my meat through that i've gained throughout the year but uh easily could be melted down it's clean it's drinkable and again there's uh something you can do that's other than the electricity of running the freezer in in normal times when everything is good it's pretty much absolutely free you're going to get you know you get the you drink the pop you rinse it out you fill it with water and chuck it in the freezer and it's working double overtime for you yep double use anything in a survival disaster scenario is always always key now we'll move on to the next uh the next category here which is food and you're going to notice a distinct pattern here seven days of food per person there's an expensive way to do this, and there's a cheap way to do this. There's also an easy way and a hard way. Believe it or not, the easy way is expensive and the hard way is cheap. Um, and I know we, we've touched on this a little bit before, but the pre-made emergency supply kits that you can get now are just phenomenal, buying a seven-day per person thing. The problem is they're spendy. They're really spendy. You can be looking at you know, 20 25 bucks per day per person on those kind of kits, but you can supplement those with your, your dried and canned meats, your canned vegetables, the rice, the instant potatoes, that kind of stuff. Um, breaking all the way down into the five, Billy, I'm going to see if you remember these, the five categories of food that you need to have stored away. No pressure. <laughs> um, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I'm assuming it's something that you've told me over the years uh, have you, have you, you ever you, made your own trail mix? Absolutely. Okay. Was there a method or pattern when you made your own trail mix, or did you just throw stuff in there you liked, which is totally oh, okay? No. Uh, it would. It definitely would be a uh, a mix of fats, proteins, and sweets. You're close. You're close. So here's here are the five scientifically proven categories that will keep you alive longer. If they're in your emergency food storage, you ready? Salty, crunchy, sweet, sour, soft. Textures and taste buds. Those five things, if you've got something that you can touch on every one of those every day, it's, it's, goodness, I don't know what it does because I'm not a psychologist, but it does something to your body that keeps your spirits up, your mentality, your morale you need those textures in your life and those flavors in your life to push you through. And the same caloric intake with that stuff will be better than if you just had the same calories and it's all crunchy or it's all sweet or all one thing. So the diversity there, that's what you're craving. And next time I ask, I hope you remember. 
I won't. But the, <laughs> the, 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 I think there's, you know, a good, this might be a good time to kind of differ, differentiate between sustaining and surviving. Uh, I, I, w- I would say that if you're worried about uh, the, the flavor palette and stuff like that, that you are, you don't, I don't think that's as important in sustaining seven days. Surviving long term, I, I I get that, but if if you need to sustain seven days and all you've got is a bunch of canned goods, I I think you'll be okay mentally. Um, so what I'm saying is, uh, you you don't if you're just going to sustain for seven days, you can be prepared enough to be comfortable in that seven days where you don't have to be eating squirrel food the entire time just to prove that you're uh, you know as cool as Jake. And I get what you're saying there, but I'm going to disagree with you because if anything you can do in a survival situation or a get through an emergency situation to keep your mental capacity at an elite high level is very important, whether it's what you're eating, playing a game, who you're with. Um, and, you know, you and I might be able to eat beans and corn every day for for a year and survive, but how pleasant is our, our wives and kids going to be when that's all they've got? You know, it's just those, those little things that when you're preparing for this kind of stuff that makes life a lot easier and lets you focus on something else other than a kid whining about all I've eaten is beans for four days. No, I, I, I guess we're agreeing, but just coming at it from different ways. I guess what, what I meant by that was it's okay to prepare more than just trail mix. Which is not what I think you were just saying, but it's definitely I, not I, what I was just saying. No, I know that's what I'm saying, but I, I'm just saying, I don't know. You almost got the "How dare you" cut, Billy? <laughs> How dare you? There it is. There's Greta. All, All right. right, we're gonna move on to shelter because those first two things are kind of boring. Shelter. Jake, before we, no. Jake, before we, yes, before we hop on to shelter, I think it, it's we've done episodes called, you know, practical, practical prepping. I really suggest people go back and listen to that one after listening to this one, only because we we're kind of going through these a little bit quick and and we really, really, really do break down each of these um, topics into depth. Like, um, for example, if you go back and listen to that episode, I actually talk about, you know, shopping strategies and, and dry goods and canned goods and which kind of dry goods are good, and which ones are, you know, and using coupons. And so th- there's a lot, it's, there's a lot more in depth in that other episode tonight where we're more so focusing on um, the, the situation in Texas and, and, and stuff like that. But I just, I, I don't want to overshadow how important that other episode we did was. No, it was. It was better. And I talk about bearing gold and guns and ammunition. So that's always entertaining. And Billy loves when I do that. In a practical episode, yeah. Yeah, practical. It's practical to bury your gold. All right, can we move on now? Or do you want to... Shelter. You sure? You sure you're ready? I am ready, sir. All right, shelter. So most emergency situations, and I'm going to deviate from this after we go over this category, but most emergency situations you're going to find yourself in, you're going to be home and it feels like a good shelter, but something happens. You don't have power. You don't have water. You don't have heat. How do you make your 2000 square foot home into a survive the disaster shelter? Uh, how I would start out is to really, um, uh, take that 2,000 square foot of livable space and really dwindle it down to maybe, you know, 800 to 1,000 square foot of space that I can control. Uh, put like basically build a micro ecosystem inside my, my uh, inside my macro eco- ecosystem. It's a lot easier to heat a fort <laughs> than it is a bedroom. You know, just a simple example of, is that. Um, I don't. Do you want me to go into my, you know, like my gas strategy and generator strategy, or where do you want to go with that? No, I mean we we can talk about power kind of in a different topic. More, I mean, let's say let's say you don't have gas, you don't have generator, and 
you've got icicles coming down off your ceiling fan, you know, what, how are you mitigating that? Are you moving out of your house? Are you staying in there? You know, for me, I've got kind of like you said, we've got a section of the house that I've, I can quickly set up into our little survival shelter, which is basically heat blankets and tarps over the wall. And then we've got, you know, some, some internal heat sources that we can vent and filter out. But I, you know, it's such a, person specific thing i don't know that it's worth sticking around on for too terribly long and maybe we'll get some questions on it but you know you might have a house that's got a wood stove which is a great thing to have or maybe they've got gas heat or something like that but um it it's i i just bring it in here that even though you've got a shelter it's worth thinking ahead of what you can do if all the things if your power goes out if your electric power and electric same thing if your power goes out your heat goes out you lose water you know those kind of things how are you going to keep your shelter a usable survival shelter i mean i think we i think we kind of covered that i'm going to you know make it smaller make it more manageable and um you know we we talked about blankets we talked about a heat uh, alternate heat source and um you know tarps and i i I, that that's what i would do and and for me um because i i have a basement that is the area i would use because it's it's underground so it's it's more insulated it's um once it's warm it stays warmer in the winter and if it's summertime out and we're dealing with extreme heat it's always cooler down underground so that is the area where i would in particular do mine it wouldn't make sense to do it in like an uninsulated garage or you know um i I guess that that's you still be be able to use the other areas of your house but if you if you centralize your activity and centralize your survivability then i I think that's a, a good step i'm with you we're on the same page there and um, I want to touch on one more thing before we we bring some people up here from from the audience uh, here on Clubhouse uh, to ask some questions or, or give us some input. But did you notice on the uh, the news clip the uh, the hundred car pileup clip? Did did you see that on the news, or is that the first you heard of it? No, you had mentioned it to me. Um, I I have to be f- clear. I don't have cable in my house. I don't watch the news very often. So, um, no, that that hearing it from you just prior to tonight is the first time I heard that. Um, sounds like a lot, and and I don't. I, I'm trying not to make like Texas jokes or Southern jokes. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know, it's like the the easy joke is sounds like a lot of people don't know how to drive in snow. But that happens. That happens everywhere where there's a whiteout or um, stuff like that. So, um, what specifically did you want to mention about it? Well, if you know, I would encourage you to go on YouTube and just just look at the look at the clips of of that wreck because I've been in that situation where you hit the you hit the ice, you know, and there's nothing you can do. You're sliding. You're going to hit whatever's in front of you. You know, luckily I've been I've been fortunate not to have anything in front of me. Um, I had the same thing happen on the way home from Wyoming this year. I actually hit some ice, and I slid for a long, long way and was trying to pick between hitting the guardrail or going off the edge of the road. And luckily, I got it straightened out before that happened. But if if you look at this clip and watch it, what you see is two or three cars get into a crash, and then people get out and look at it. And then semi-trucks come and crash into them. And then there's cars behind that and then more semi-trucks. And within about three or four minutes, there's 30 or 40 people walking around on the highway while these vehicles are crashing into each other. And, you know, what, what struck me about it, one, you know, what a hard choice, whether staying in your vehicle or getting out of your vehicle, because some of those guys, you know, I would say, don't get out of your vehicle, you know, wait, but some of those dudes were getting crushed between semi trucks with with their vehicles. But then you get out, and not only you expose the elements, but you've got cars sliding all around you. And you know, I think in your vehicle, I think is a, a super important place. Just as just as important at home that you need to be prepared in that vehicle. I'm guilty of it sometimes. I was thinking the other day taking my kid to school. And you know, I had had my shorts and my Crocs on, and it's it's 15 degrees here, and I drop my kid off at school and I'm like, you know, what happens if I, if I get in a wreck, the car breaks down, something like that. 
and now all of a sudden I'm stuck in this 20 degree weather. What happens if I'm on the highway and there's a hundred car pile up? Uh, those guys were outside for a long time. You can't clear up a hundred car pile up quick. I mean, you're talking hours and hours on the roadside. If you don't have stuff with you to keep you warm or first aid equipment, especially, you know, you can really be in a bad situation there. Yeah. So I'm glad you actually brought that up because so I grew up with a with a dad that owned um, gas stations and tow trucks. So um, cl- clearing wrecks and pulling people out of ditches and stuff like that was, it was, was second nature to me growing up. And um, and one thing my dad has always harped on. You know, my dad's not an outdoorsman or anything, but my dad's in that industry. My mom's in the insurance agency, so there's a lot of preparedness that goes on in my family growing up. And we have go bags in, in the uh, in our vehicles, and it's not necessarily a, a go bag. Is like not a bug out bag, but it, but it's uh, it's a cold it's cold weather gear, hats, coats. Um, I mean, it's not bibs and stuff like that, but I always have boots with me. Um, I always have a shovel, a uh, bag of rock salt, and um, and one of the other things that I have with me is knowledge. Even if it's just getting your vehicle unstuck, there's a lot of ways to do that that don't require a tow truck. You know, you use floor mats, use the rock salt, use you can use you know remove snow, just just a, a lot of other stuff. And I, I think if you prepare yourself to be in your vehicle, just think if you had to stay overnight in your vehicle obviously if you have to get out of your vehicle there's a lot of other you know issues that come up with that but let's just say it's as simple as you're out in nowhere with no cell service and you're going to stay the night in your vehicle are you going to be and it doesn't run are you going to be able to do that and my answer is always going to be yes um but and i i think it's really important for everyone else to do the same and um you know you, you just you never know and, and it's not super hard to be prepared is it's a gym bag guys have a gym bag in your trunk have some rock salt in your trunk and generally you're going to be good to go yep i agree and and um for everyone in the audience here joining us uh, live on clubhouse we would love if you guys just hit the little hand raise button down there if you've got a question or input go ahead and hit that and we'll We'll bring you up and, and talk about it. I know we've had a few people bounce in and out of here that are from Texas, so we definitely love to hear from you. And while we are waiting for that, Billy, let's uh, first aid. Let's talk first aid because this is something that I am very big on. Um, I think it's something we skip a lot because it's not really fun. It's not You can't really show it off or Instagram it, but it's such an important, important piece of, of the puzzle. Yeah, so just like I talked about my, you know, what my parents do, my the rest of my entire family is in the medical field, and obviously I'm in law enforcement. I don't know a lot of people that drive around with a CPR mask and a bag valve <laughs> like I do, and my sister does. Um, <laughs> but um, and, and I'm and I I know uh, for a fact that, and that's why we'll talk have you talk more about this, but you do focus more on this for me. The first aid supplies is as a basic first aid kit. Um, also in my first aid kit, I, I do have chemical hand warmers and, um, so I have a basic first aid kit. I have a mask and ball, uh, valve so that I can provide CPR without getting someone out of their car if need be. And I also have plenty of cutting utensils, and uh, which um, basically, if I had to cut a, um, basically, I had to cut a seatbelt or do do whatever I need to do to uh, to help people. Um, again, kind of uh, focusing on car type stuff here. Obviously, at home you're going to have more, but I'll let you uh, fill that in, Jake. Yeah, I think you know, no matter where you're at, the the, the four main injuries that are going to happen. You got falls, blunt force, trauma, cuts, and then preparing for infections in a survival situation. Knowing how to treat those four things are are the most important thing. You know, I I encourage everybody to carry you know a daily amount of of medicine. I carry all kinds of um, you know Excedrin, migraine. I get migraines a lot, so I carry that kind of stuff. The basic stuff I use on an everyday basis. I always have in that first aid kit because it encourages me to use it. But 
the most important thing for, in my opinion, for people with families is when you're building your first aid kit is make sure you've got stuff in there, not only to treat yourself, but especially your children, because when it comes to first aid stuff and prepackaged things, most things you get won't fit children. So think of your family, think of who's going to be with you, what you can use on them. And there are some amazing, amazing YouTube videos out there on how to be prepared for for first aid situations. So, so with that, we've got Dan joining us here. Dan, is it okay to tell everybody where you're at? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> so Dan is joining us from <laughs> Texas, and it sounds like you're doing good down there, Dan. How is, how is everything uh, treating you down there? Uh, we, we're definitely on the, the back end of it and getting a lot better. The temperatures have warmed up today for most of the state. Um, now, I'm in pretty well central to south Texas, um, where we're going to be warmer quicker. But by this weekend, by the end of the weekend, we should be back up in the 60s around here, and the north should be well above freezing. Um, But what I wanted to mention is that I'm a Midwestern boy, grew up, lived in the four worst weather states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan um, at different times of my life. And it is when I moved down here to Texas, you know, we're talking about this winter weather because it's more, it's the issue right now, but the, the way that people approach driving down here is completely different than the way I learned how to drive or I've seen, you know, the upper part of the United States drivers handle it. And it is, it is no wonder these type of things happen when we have these once in a hundred year type of situations. Now, Go ahead, when you say, sorry, when you say the way people drive, is it vehicle specific? Like, obviously, you think of Texas, you think oh, everyone's got a pickup truck, but I bet a lot of them don't have four wheel drive. Or is it like aggressiveness or just general, like not knowing you have to stop early? Well, it, it, it's several things. It's, it's the, you know, it's the ice, not knowing how to maneuver on it and to, mm-hmm. like, and especially. Especially it's the bridges. You know, the overpass is always ice up first. So, you know, I was taught when you approach an overpass in icy conditions, you take your foot off the accelerator, you coast through the, and keep it straight. Don't apply right. brakes. Don't apply brakes and coast through it. Because once you hit the ice, whatever direction you're pointed, that's where you're going to go. Um, people, they break on the ice. There's, there's panic almost. Now, I'm not saying they're bad drivers. They're just not used to doing it four months out of the year. Um, where we're up in you know Michigan, Ohio, and and such, uh, we you do, and um, and and it's always the funny. So there, Texas loves their trucks, and I'm I'm one of them as well. Um, and we have a lot of four wheel drive vehicles down here. But as you guys okay. know, it doesn't mean anything on ice. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, but the problem is, it gives people a false sense a. a false sense of security and that's even up here people think oh it's four-wheel drive i can go drive whenever the hell i want no you can't correct correct now on the other side of that there is a lot of people who took their lives and and went out helping people uh, especially i saw it more up north on the news to where they had a lot of snow we did not have a lot of snow down here um, that was more dallas and north a lot of people were in their four-wheel trucks were out there helping pull people out of the ditches were helping uh, get people to safety because they couldn't drive or didn't have the car to drive in it. So there is the other side of there's people who are who gave up their own personal comfort to go out and help, and that was and we see that great. We, we I, I totally agree with you, Dan. I did actually I don't watch a lot of news, but I did see a lot of that happening. And it's important to notice we see a lot of that with the outdoors lifestyle type people in all these scenarios for you know the those who are into the outdoors a we have the equipment and b we have the hearts and and you see that when you look at floods in louisiana or even like tornadoes it's the guys out there with their duck boats and the john boats doing you know assisting the first responders getting the medical teams to where they need to be you know evacuating people and uh I, i just think again we saw that in texas shining through and it makes me proud to be an outdoorsman i agree Dan, how did you feel? Um, I, I know you had some issues with electricity. How did you feel on a on a preparedness level? How, how if you had to rate yourself, where would where do you think you were at for this go around? 
Well, you know, listening to you guys, I heard a couple of different things you say. You're saying you talk about preparing and then you talk about prepping. And I am not a prepper. I will raise my hand and say that. But I like to consider myself a preparer um, from a standpoint of, and the different categories you guys went through, from a standpoint of food, I, I, we're definitely within that category. We keep the covered stocks, the freezer stocked, uh, liquids on hand. Um, now, when it comes to shelter, um, we're in a type of situation where we did lose electricity, nothing for long term, but we have a fireplace. And the and I know during the intro, you, t- you had one of the um, news bulletins or whatever talk about um, not, no communication or there wasn't any type of warnings. Now, I did not feel that that was prevalent in my area because we were getting texts from our electric company keeping us apprised of what was going on. We were getting texts from our water company apprising us what was going on, when we should boil, when we should not, uh, that we should expect rolling uh, brownouts, they were calling it. And basically, we were in a situation where we'd have two to three hours of power and off an hour. And we just rotated that way. And that started Monday morning through uh, Wednesday morning. Now, what I did is that we shut down all the bedrooms and just basically focused on kitchen and living room because that's, yep. where, the, that's where the fireplace is. And I had wood ready to go if we got anywhere past longer than an hour of electricity because at that point, that's when the house starts cooling down pretty rapidly. So I, I saw on some news reports uh, when I was reading, I think this one was on the Washington Post where they're talking about the prices you guys are paying for electricity going from like $22 for a megawatt up to like nine grand a megawatt of per hour. Do you think your bill's going to go up? And then I would imagine there's got to be some form of government assistance that's going to wipe that out. <laughs> uh, it, it was funny. A little, <laughs> the, the, let's see, it was Monday. Yeah, the morning that the electricity started doing that, I got my email from the electric company saying my bill was due. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's perfect <laughs> timing. But... I don't know what to expect, truthfully, on that, Billy. Um, I, it's it's going to be one of those, I got 30 days till my next bill comes, and we'll see what it is uh, when I get it. Um, so I really don't know. Now, I do know my water bill will be a little higher because I had a busted pipe outside and didn't find it for a little bit. But So it was running. Yeah, it was running. Um, and, and interesting enough, that that happens after the freeze, when it starts thawing. Um, because outside those pipes will freeze and that, that ice stays there. And then right. when it starts thawing, that's when it starts running. Yeah. Well, well I mean, we're, we're, we're glad you're okay. I have, a, I have an uncle up in the, uh, the Dallas area mm. who they had to move him into, um, he, he's on the, he's not in hospice, but he's pretty close to it. They had to move them into a, a special facility that had, you know, generator power and everything because oh, yeah. of all the machines and stuff. So there's uh there's a lot of people in Texas that, that are hurting. Um, well, from, I, and, and I want to make one point on the electricity at the two, which I learned, I did not know that until this incident happened is that the majority of Texas is a self-contained electric electrical grid. There's very few, uh, cities and a couple border cities that actually are connected outside the state of Texas, but we are a self-contained grid. And that was part of the breakdown as well, because the, the massive land mass of Texas all was impacted by this. It wasn't like one area where they could steal power from another area. Everybody was clamoring for the electricity as well as internal systems were shutting down windmills, force, uh, wind power were frozen. The coal generating plants and the natural gas plants, their, their um, equipment and instruments were not made to work in five degree and nine degree weather. So they were seasoned up. So we were just, we didn't have the resources to keep making electricity. Yeah, it's a really good point because you had like Amarillo without power, but Oklahoma City had plenty of power. And if you look, you know, latitude, longitude, they're at the same level. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's um, it, that, that's pretty interesting. I guess my question for you now, Dan, is 
so obviously there was mistakes made and, and what and not saying you made mistakes, but what uh, learning from this whole situation, will you, what, I guess, what will you change about um, your preparedness or, or your lack thereof mm-hmm. so that if this does happen again, it'll be easier on you? Well, I think the first thing I'm going to do is go up into my attic and make sure every single pipe up there is insulated because to an earlier point, all, we don't have basements down here. The majority of Texas mm-hmm. does not. So all the utilities go, are up in the attic. And, yeah, I went up there, you know, thawing some pipes out because we did have some frozen pipes up there. Nothing burst, but it was, okay, I, I need to make sure these get insulated and really shored up. So the next time this happened, we don't have this issue. Um, but from, an, from anything else... I don't think that I'm going to really change anything. I don't think I'm going to go out and get a house generator and, and pay tens of thousands of dollars for it to a once in a 10 year situation to happen. Um, so, you know, I don't know if there's anything, at least where I'm at in San Antonio that I'm going to do. Awesome, man. Well, we're glad, uh, we're glad you made it through. We're glad things are turning around down there in Texas. And with that, quickly, as quickly as it started, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Survive the Hunt podcast. We will be back here next week. Make sure to follow me, follow Billy on here, and we will post the time as well on my Instagram, at Survive the Hunt. Thank you guys for joining us, and we will see you next week. Have a good one, guys. Stay warm.